to our um, mid-October session that uh, the three of us are presenting today. We are all board members of the Peace and Justice Studies Association. And as you know, I think many of you have come here before we um, made our conference, which was supposed to be in Florida. We turned it into an online conference spread over three months. This is our second month. And our theme for this month is storytelling and social justice. So um, our session tonight, uh, this afternoon, is going to be on the mythologies of forgiveness. And um, we are planning to introduce ourselves, you know, as we begin our own presentation. But uh, thank you all for being here. And we hope you'll continue to join us for the remaining sessions in October for which you can use the same uh, Zoom link. And I'll remind you again at the end. But we're gonna start with uh, Wim. He's gonna start his presentation first and then I'll go and then Michelle. So. Thank you, Pushpa. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to get us started. My uh, Forgiveness is my quote unquote area of expertise. And I want to put you guys into the perspective of sorts of how did this become my story? How did this become my focus? Um, and it's really hard to figure out what the starting point is in, in many ways to think about where does my understanding, where does this narrative, where does it come from? And so I'm trying not to make my presentation too discombobulated. I, I do want it to be grounded and focused, but at the same time, like my story is a very kind of traumatized and challenging one of my behaviors or contradictions in and of themselves. So on the one hand, I do want you guys to have some sort of awareness that I'm grounding this in a methodology of using myself as a case study, as a way of accessing other points about our field of peace, um, our study of justice, our observations of challenges in society and how to respond to conflict. So the framework here I'm, I'm trying to present should really actually be pretty simple and it almost looks like too much jargon, but reconciling conflicted mythologies. Um, and the mythologies I'm, I'm gonna share are, are I think pretty straightforward, but I'll, I'll try to get to the point where there is something paradoxical here. And I think if, if my story can be a lesson of sorts, I'd like for that to be helpful, but mostly I just think that part of what we do when we get together through this experience that I've told people um, year after year, I say, uh, PJSA is my Disneyland. I see people I love. I ground myself. It's, it's spiritual. It's, it's fulfilling. Um, it's something I love. And, and so the storytelling part here, um, Pushpa, Michelle, and myself, we're in charge of the programming for this month. And so our uh, injection of mythology and forgiveness into the storytelling part um, really kind of fits right in the center of this programming. Um, not so much because we're juxtaposing it as being in between the extremes of the other presentations of the month, but because we know it's coming in November. Um, and that's been on the background of the conference was that we always knew that there was gonna be a very divided politic this fall. Um, so all of this is to say that we have a genealogy here. Um, and not only have we had prior conferences, but these pictures are from prior conferences on this exact same day. This is, this is what we share in, in common with our date in October. Um, Shifting Stories and Practices of Peace was our theme in San Diego in 2014. And Cultivating the Just and Peaceable Self was our theme when we were in Virginia in 2015. And when Emily Welty gave her keynote address on this day five years ago, I thought that this slide really captured something special, right? Like a tourist at our conference, I take pictures as a reminder, good intentions are not enough. On, on the right, 
It's Mark Lance and David Ragland presenting on the Truth Telling Project. Truths, we're sharing our truths. We come together to be honest and open and maybe not always agree, though we always have so much in common. Um, but the study and tracing of lines of descent or development, right? Our mythologies are a way of sharing our stories with a moral purpose. Um, for the last four years, I have been motivated by this type of methodology called an autoethnography. And I realize at points that I haven't done much to actually set up what this is. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the presentation today. So autoethnography is research and writing that seeks to describe and systematically analyze graphy, personal experience, auto, in order to understand cultural experiences, ethno. This approach challenges canonical ways of doing research and representing others and treats research as a political, political socially just and socially conscious act. Um, mythology, mythos, story of the people, logos, an appeal to logic, a way of persuading with reason, facts, and figures. Mythology, the study and interpretation of tales or fables which explain the human condition like good and evil, evil or the meaning of suffering. So my story for the purposes of the subject of forgiveness really starts with my political awakening, which in March of 1991, as a 13-year-old, I sat on a couch with my father and watched in graphic detail the Los Angeles Police Department brutalize Rodney King. I watched and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My father watched. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. I asked so many questions that day. It probably is the first time that I had a serious adult conversation with my father. Maybe I had build, been building up to this point. It's not like life had been without its own events prior to. But on this occasion and asking questions because I saw something that was impossible. To me, the way that the police officers were treating this man who was limp and lifeless on the ground was unimaginable, right? I had been raised with the mythology of respecting authority and believing that those behind the badge served with a certain dedication and commitment to the protection and service of the community that would make it impossible. On the one hand, you would think to yourself things like, what are we not seeing? What led to this? But at the same time, th there was just no way that the beating could keep going and keep going and keep going and going and going. And it was horrible. And they would reshow it and reshow it. And I asked questions and I asked so many questions and I can't remember all of the answers. But when I was done asking questions, and this might have been after 90 minutes, it might have been two hours, I really couldn't tell you. I wasn't taking notes. The first thing my father did was he went to the telephone. He called a coworker and he apologized. He said he just saw the news. He couldn't believe it. He felt horrible because he'd been hearing these stories about pre police brutality for so long. And he never really trusted the story for being what it was at face value. He always thought it must have been some sort of embellishment or hyperbole or it couldn't be that bad. He told his friend, I'm sorry that I never got it. This is the moment when I understood something about forgiveness that was separate from the Christianity I was raised with and the general practice of tell them that you're sorry. And he said, he's sorry, now forgive him. And that kind of stuff that I was raised with. He was apologizing, to be clear, not just for the acts of violence being perpetrated by police officers on a black body. He was apologizing because he didn't believe the truth of the experience of those who were oppressed. But he didn't put the second part into the words. 
He just said, I'm sorry, he didn't qualify it. But I, I, I think I've come to understand that. So the political awakening happens the night that I have this conversation, which details to me that there are different lived experiences and serious injustice in this country. By April 29th of 1992, when the police officers who have committed this heinous crime are acquitted, um, I have, I think, lots of growth. One, because, you know, 13 to 14 years old, you just go through a lot. But also you have that much time to reflect on it. The acquittal was impossible to everyone. There's no way that you could have seen what happened and then have accepted that there is no crime that had commi been committed. People, I just want to say, can we all get along? Can we get along? It's a message that comes in the middle of riots. Rioting was... Uh, uh, byproduct of the unjust verdict. So I have three names up here. And the reason that there's three names is that there's three different similar circum sets of circumstance that happen in Los Angeles in different periods of time. Marquette Fry was stopped for uh, uh, driving under the influence. And when this pursuit or when this, uh, when, when this apprehension uh, went sideways, this catalyzed the Watts Rebellion in the 60s. The traffic stop went sideways in March of 1991, led to an acquittal that caused like the Los Angeles riots. Um, and Ezel Ford, he's a uh, de developmentally disabled um, individual who ends up killed during a unlawful stop in Los Angeles. And unlike the other two events, right? I don't have pictures. Maybe I should have done a better job putting pictures from the Watts Rebellion up to showcase. Um, the successful Black Lives Matter movement in getting attention and some justice in East L. Ford's case, right? And you see the protesters on the left, but these aren't specifically from the events related to Ezel Ford. Actually, there's been so many different cases that most people didn't hear of Ezel Ford because they heard about um, Mike Brown. But um, we, we didn't have the riots. We didn't have things blow up. Um, per, perhaps there is some energy that's coming from social justice, and maybe there is some forgiveness that's taking place that's preventing um, the sparks of anger to turn into the flames of hatred and uh, property destruction. So again, 65, you have Watts Rebellion. Um, part of what fuels that is the police chief saying of the protesters then rioters, they're like monkeys in a zoo. Um, the police chief in 1992 is also credited with having a bad response, but saying things that were very inflammatory, doing the opposite of de-escalating the conflict. But the 2014 case, he's unarmed, like so many other stories. It's controversial. It's questionable. No charges were filed, but studies indicated in 2017 that Los Angeles residents are less hopeful than they've been in 20 years when asked about the prospects of another violent convulsion. Um, researchers found that about 60% of a cross section of Angelinos believe a civil disturbance could happen again sometime in the next five years. Young adults, 18 to 29, were even more convinced another riot is looming with seven out of 10 expecting one in the near future. Right, so the structures are, are present, people are responding to them. This is the state of affairs at the time that um, we're finding out about Ezel Ford, but it doesn't actually catalyze into that activity. Um, and it's part of a broader story, um, a broader story of racism and power and segregation and slavery. And if nothing else, we still have people who, are campaigning for their political uh, purposes and agendas that they will protect suburbs. 
if anything, if we look at this timeline, the most remarkable thing is, is that they seem to suggest that since 1954, it's green, it's a go, things are good, but I think we know otherwise. This is now, October 16th, Senator from Georgia makes racist jokes about another politician, right? He's worked with Senator Harris for a long time. It's unacceptable. But I was a just joking racist myself, right? And this is the challenge. Like at the same time, I'm becoming a, a, like waking up to the reality of injustice through the conversations with my father. At the same time that that's going on, I'm going to school and absorbing a toxic racist culture from my hometown where racist jokes were the norm. And if I'm honest, <laughs> What the things I, I would have said to fit in are much worse than what Senator Purdue is saying to dog whistle for racists. So the paradox, forgiving the unrepentant functions as condoning the offense. Remaining unforgiving increases the suffering of the victims. This is the challenge that my students tell me about all the time. They don't wanna forgive people who haven't deserved it. And I have students who tell me if they stay angry, that it hurts them physically, mentally. Hanging on to anger is, is, is challenging. Forgiving one act can dismiss history, right? If we let go of these infractions, we're forgetting about the long history of things that they're attached to. Forgiving history means accepting the crimes people you never met have, uh, committed against those who haven't been born, right? The racism of 300 years ago, the violence of 300 years ago has created inequalities that exist today that will impact people still in the generations to come. Who am I to try to interrupt this line that connects the injustice to the beneficiaries and so forth? Forgiving structural violence is done for victims who have not consented. If I forgive racism, who am I to do that? Who am I to forgive something that has caused people pain and shame and suffering and taken lives away, right? These people have not consented for somebody to speak on their behalf. Holding on to anger and outrage is toxic and self-defeating. Right? Staying angry doesn't allow you to live in the peace and harmony that you deserve. It's not fair. The paradox is there's no winning. If you do it, if you don't do it, it's struggle. The paradox, as I relate it to my own mythology, nothing has been more important to my own personal growth than being forgiven by myself and others. If I know what forgiveness has done to save my life, how could I justify withholding it from other people, right? So I'll stop there, but su suffice it to say that other people would have memories of March, 1991, which are different from mine. And I think that's good. I think we have to appreciate our different experiences. But I'll also go on to say that I start my dissertation with reference to this event. And I go into greater detail on it because it truly has challenged my thinking for almost 30 years. So with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague Pushpa, uh, who I had the distinct pleasure of working on with a statement on behalf of the Peace and Justice Studies Association earlier this year and responding to the dual epidemic of police brutality and racist violence in this country. Um, which is to say from that genealogy section that I presented, we're not just talking about it. We're making positions, we're taking stands, we're pushing for change. We have lots of activism in this organization. And thank you. Sorry, I think I didn't disable the screen sharing. Uh, it's, it's done then. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you're good. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. That was uh, really great. And I see a lot of similarities coming up with mine, which is very exciting because I'm going to go 
talk about uh, things happening in India. So give me one minute and I will share my screen and then we'll get uh, started. So I am going to talk uh, about the conflict between the Hindus and the Muslims in the state of Gujarat in India. And to introduce myself, uh, this is the state where I come from. I grew up here and um, I grew up uh, amidst riots between Hindus and the Muslims all the time, all the time. Right, so that's my growing up. That's what I know is the tensions between these two communities, and the resulting, you know, the violence that you witness, and then the curfews that you experience, where you are locked up and you know uh, segregated in your home from uh, members of the other community. School was a great place to interact with everyone, but so often we couldn't go to school. We just couldn't go to school because of the violence and because there would be curfews. So my primary education and even secondary and higher secondary education in the state of Gujarat was terrible, dismal, right? If to put it very briefly, <laughs> that would be the one word that I would use. So for me, this conflict is very personal. So you will hear me speak about some things uh, with a very deep personal conviction and an opinion that I have. But I like what Wim said is that our experience is our experience, right? If that's how I experience it, then that's how I'm going to talk about it. So I'd like you to keep that in mind as we go along, because um, although I was not there when the actual this particular violence took place in 2002, I still like to uh, <clears throat> immerse myself in thinking about, you know, historically, how did we get here? So 2002, this is the map of Gujarat. 2002, this is when, uh, uh, you know, the, there was a, a violence that was committed against the Hindu majority community that was returning in this train. This train compartment that you see was a group of Hindus who were coming back from the northern part of India after uh, working on demolishing a mosque and building a temple in the exact same spot. It's called the Babri Masjid. And this actual, uh, the demolition or this attack against the Babri Masjid happened in, 2000, uh, in 1992. So good 10 years earlier, but this was in 2002. They had gone back to the Babri Masjid site and they were coming back after doing what they call religious work. When in um, a place called Godra, which is <clears throat> where there is a significant number of Muslims, the, this particular compartment was burnt down in that uh, when, it, when the train had stopped at the Godra station. Now, I don't want to get into the details of it, but there's a lot to say that the people who set fire to it were Muslims, or at least that's how the story went. And the people, of course, inside the train were all Hindus. There's forensic evidence that points that the fire was set uh, from inside the compartment, not from outside, questioning this, uh, you know, this story that it was the Muslims who set fire. But irrespective of it, this was our trigger event in 2002. Following this for three days, there was one day of lull, you know, that storm, uh, the calm before the storm, that one day of lull, and then it just broke out. The violence just broke out for the next three days. Three days of intense violence where Muslims were particularly targeted, uh, attacked, burned, violence that was almost genocidal in its scales, particularly against women. And I'll talk a little bit more about all of these things, but it's a few hundred thousands died in those three days. We call it the genocide and properties were destroyed. Uh, Muslims were displaced and the displacement went on for years. The tensions between the Hindu and the Muslim communities go on, but the main significant aspect of the 2002 violence as opposed to the riots in which I grew up is that this one was truly sponsored by the government. The government was behind a lot of this. There's enough evidence to prove that. Also the fact that the police stayed away from whatever was happening. They refused to help any of the Muslims who were being attacked in this time period. So in this background, and I'm going to talk more and more about it. The current prime minister of India, Narendra Modi was then the chief minister of Gujarat. Okay, so he's often held responsible for a lot of things that happened in 2002. 
And uh, like I said in the beginning, this uh, month is about stories. It's uh, storytelling and social justice. So I have a few stories to tell you. So the picture on the, on, uh, the left is Bilkis Banu. She was 19 years old and fleeing with her family members, 17 of them uh, from these Hindu mobs. This is in 2002. She's fleeing with them. They were near a field when they were attacked by the mobs. So of the 17 of them, three of them survived. She's one of them. And there was one other cousin and a small child that survived. Vilkis at 19 was five, min five months pregnant and had a three-year-old daughter. She, her mother and her two sisters and her other cousin who had just delivered a baby two days earlier were all raped, gang raped and were all killed. Vilkis was left for dead after being gang raped, although she begged for some mercy because she was five months pregnant. The men who raped them were all known to these women. They were men from their very village. They all knew them. She identified the men. She knew exactly who they were. And she said later she thought they were her brothers, but clearly they were not. Bilkis's three-year-old daughter was taken by one of these men, thrown into the air and smashed to the ground and killed. So she witnessed also her daughter's murder, her mother, her two sisters, many of her cousins and others, and all the men in the family who were killed. Vilkis survived, and she has been telling her story repeatedly over and over again. Very recently, a good 13, 14 years later, her case was actually transferred by the Supreme Court outside of Gujarat to the Bombay High Court because the Supreme Court said the Gujarat Court would never give her justice. In the Bombay High Court, she got justice. 11 of the men that had gang raped her were convicted and received life imprisonment, although a few of them were acquitted. But when she was asked whether she was now happy, she said, this is what she said, I can't forgive these people. How can I ever forgive them? And part of what she was saying is, how could she forgive on behalf of her three-year-old daughter who lost her life? How could she forgive on behalf of her mother or her sisters who couldn't be here to forgive anyone? She didn't have the right to forgive was what she was saying, but she was also saying, I'm not looking for revenge. I just want justice. So I just want us to keep in mind these words, you know, that she was um, in some ways juxtaposing forgiveness and justice. Here is a picture of Maya Kodani, the woman who's wearing a white sari. Maya Kodani was a member of the Legislative Assembly in 2002. She's a gynecologist. She's a very smart woman that is an orator. Uh, Maya Kodani actually led the mobs that killed over 97 people in the area called Naroda Patia. She led the mobs. She was the one that told the mobs to go after the Muslims, attack and kill them. Maya Kodani subsequently, a few years later, was made a minister by Narendra Modi in his government. There's no question of her apologizing. There was no question of her um, you know, being punished for what she had done. In fact, she was rewarded. And all the people who identified her, she's a doctor in the area, people knew her. Everyone could identify that she was the one leading this violence. And when she got con uh, convicted, she was the only woman in Narendra Modi's government that actually was convicted. Isn't that interesting that it was a woman in the end who, what, who was convicted. And Maya Kodani spent years in the jail. She received 28 years and she was released subsequently in 2018 because uh, Narendra Modi's right-hand man, uh, Amit Shah said she was with him in the parliament when this happened and was not in Naroda Patia. Irrespective, this is what Maya Kodani said when she was freed. It was God's way of testing me and that's it. That is it. That's all she had to say for her role in the violence. So now let's talk about what forgiveness looked like among the Hindus and the Muslims. This man became the face of everything that was aggressive, everything that was terrifying about the 2002 violence. His name is Ashok Mochi. And Ashok Mochi was, as you can see over here, the person you know, who was 
visually making this, uh, uh, you know, uh, aggression known to people that he's the guy that was behind a lot of the violence that was taking place. He denies it subsequently. He says that he was actually one of the people that was living on the streets, that was suffering and didn't know what to do, was terrified of what was happening with the mobs. And because he had a beard, he was scared that people would think he's a Muslim. And so he decided that he would show himself as a Hindu, but he never really attacked anyone is what he says. Although there are people in the area who have identified him as one of the members of the mob. Here you see a person who became also the face of the suffering of the Muslims in 2002. This is Kutubuddin Ansari and, oh, sorry, I don't know what is happening. Kutubuddin Ansari uh, was begging for his life when this photographer took this image, a Muslim man, right? So he also became an image of 2002 violence. And then you see over here years later where uh, a particular newspaper brought them together, you know, in an effort to reconcile the communities, to bring them together. And here's what Ashok said. He said, 2002 was a blunder. I want to now speak about insaniyat, which means humanity. This is after he had been arrested because some of the people identified him as the mobs and he was sent to prison, then released. And then he began to get this fear in him. He said that, you know, if he was going to live on the streets, he needed to make sure that the Hindus always knew he was on their side, but he didn't want to antagonize the Muslims because, you know, they could potentially attack him as he was living on the street and had no protection. So he, this was his statement, if this is a statement of forgiveness. Kutubuddin, who came together with him in this event, and Ashok actually offered him a rose. Kutubuddin said, my brother Ashok asked for my forgiveness. It means a lot to me. Let this be a beginning of a new chapter in humanity. That's what he said. You know, as a Muslim man, he had said that he accepted Ashok's um, request for forgiveness, although the statement doesn't really read as if it's an apology. So Gujarat 2002 should never be forgotten is one story that came out of this. The other story that came out of this, it's so easy to forget Gujarat 2002. All you had to do is to say that you had made a mistake or you had committed a blunder. And if you are now ready to talk about humanity, we are ready to move on. So these, both these stories emerged from this particular, um, you know, from these stories of these two gentlemen. So I was referring to the uh, demolition of the mosque in 1992. These are some pictures from there where the Hindu uh, groups had climbed on top of this uh, historic 16th century mosque to destroy it. And here's a story that is of Balbir Singh, who's a Rajput and who claims that he went into the state of Uttar Pradesh where this mosque is uh, from the state of Haryana and was looked down upon by the people of Uttar Pradesh who looked at him and his family as being somebody who was uneducated, backwards, etc. His family actually, very interestingly, they're very Gandhians in their approach and they certainly did not approve of the demolition of the Babri Masjid. However, he felt that the only people who were actually nice to him were the fundamentalist Hindu groups. And so he joined them and he was one of those people on the mosques in the previous picture that you saw where he actually went in and demolished the mosque, right? And now you see this person, oh, sorry. The person on the right here, Mohammed Amir, guess who is this? Balbir Singh. Balbir Singh converted into Islam because he said he came to this realization that what he did was so wrong. He was very sorry for the role that he played and this really came after his father died. And he met a, a, a Muslim priest, an imam, who was so kind to him that he thought what he had done was so wrong and he needed to repent for it. So Balbir Singh became Muhammad Amir and very interestingly, his brother converted as well and so did his wife. But there's also an interesting story of how he convinced his wife to marry his older brother because his older brother lost his wife and he decided his wife should now become his brother's wife so as to help their kids. So there's a lot of things around Mohammed Amir that is weird. And then he himself got married to a Muslim widow. But Mohammed Amir says his goal now is to repair and rebuild a hundred mosques. For everything that he had done to destroy the Babri Masjid, this is what he was going to do in his life. And then this, the author of this, um, the person who wrote this article in the Mumbai Mirror said the toughest kind of forgiveness is self forgiveness and the road to it is a lonely one, but it is also where mad meets the divine. 
And I found this very, very intriguing, this thing, especially given everything that Mohammed Amir had done. By the way, he also went and got three master's degree in, in during this period of time when he was converting from being a Hindu to a Muslim. So that's his story. So now um, I want to go to what our chief minister then and now Prime Minister Narendra Modi said. Uh, he made this quote when he was a chief minister and he said, one only has to ask for forgiveness if one is guilty of such a crime. This is when he was asked, would he ask for forgiveness for what happened in Gujarat? And he said, no. And he said, you would only ask if you were guilty of a crime. If you think it's such a big crime, why should the culprit be forgiven? He was talking about himself. He said, just because you know it, I'm the chief minister, you don't have to forgive me. If you think the crime was so big, even if I ask for forgiveness, don't forgive me. I think Modi should get the biggest punishment possible if he's guilty and that the world should know there is intolerance for such political leaders. So he said he would not ask for forgiveness, but here is the reason why he wouldn't also ask for forgiveness. This particular poem by Kadamanita Ramakrishnan kind of, um, you know, captures the feeling around uh, Modi's role in 2002 violence. This poem says, while returning from Gujarat, I met with a Gujarati going to Kochi for business. What's your good name? He asked. Ramakrishnan, I replied. Ram, Kishan, Ram, Kishan, Ram, Ram, Hindu gods names. By coming closer to me, by appreciating me, are you a non-vegetarian? He asked. Not like that, I answered. And you? We, the Vaishnav people, are pure vegetarians, he said, with a glint of pride. What about some of grass eaters among you who have eaten a fetus ripping out a womb and its mother, I blurted out abruptly. Metamorphosed into a beast, showing his cannon teeth, squinting his eyebrows, he growled, kya? What? Right? And this is in reference to what happened in Gujarat 15 years earlier. This poem was written. And it is true. A lot of women, pregnant women's, um, uh, bellies were ripped open, the fetuses were removed from the bellies and thrown and killed. You know, I told you, it was very genocidal violence that took place in Gujarat. So that's what this particular poem is talking about. Now with Modi as the prime minister, one of the things the government did was to criminalize the triple talaq bill, which is basically a Muslim man saying talaq three times to his wife and that would be counted as a divorce. The Muslim women said it was a victory for them, but there's very divided opinion on this because if you are saying that you're criminalizing divorce, it means those men will be punished for just saying talaq, for just asking for divorce. While you can legally nullify the type of divorce, many women ask, why should you actually criminalize this? Why should you punish our husbands? So this this particular bill that Modi's government passed, people ask, is it really pro-women or is it being anti-minority? And then you have this next one here where you see Muslims campaigning for Modi's political party. And people ask, how does that even happen? And how does that simply happen? Some people will say it's simply opportunism. They're just taking advantage of an opportunity presented to them to join the ruling party. Some say it's just practical, it's what you need to do to survive. And yet others say it's purely selfish because why are you joining the BJP? Is because you are getting something out of it. You don't care about your fellow Muslims. You're just doing it for your own growth. And often middle-class and educated Muslims are accused of this. So all this to say in this particular slide is that you do have Muslims who are supporting the very same people who have killed them, who have butchered them. And the question really is, are they doing this with forgiveness or are they doing this is because this is the most opportune thing to do, the most practical thing to do at this particular moment. Then I think I have just one more after this. This is a Gandhi's quote where Gandhi says, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is in the attribute of the strong. So this is a very tricky one. So if you cannot forgive, you're weak. If you can, you're stronger. The Bhagavad Gita says the same thing. You go to God, God is forget compassionate and loving. You know, it's not possible for us humans to do it, but God can, and God is always forgiving and God is always compassionate and uh, so on. And when God forgives you, your negative karma is purified. But again, it becomes a little bit selfish in the sense that you think you're doing it so that your karma, your negative karma is purified and you can be reborn in ways that, you know, you are not paying for your sins. So as humans, we never, we can never not hurt others, but it's the forgiveness that we are seeking is from God. 
And here I have some uh, thoughts from the field of conflict resolution where we talk about apology and forgiveness as being on the two sides of the same coin. And it doesn't mean we really forget, but you know, you forgive actually to remember. And apology and forgiveness are important to get past those negative emotions that we have, anger, hatred, and so on. And they are prerequisites for reconciliation. We often study this in our field. But Asghar Ali Engineer, who is a Muslim uh, reformist writer and social activist in India, he's passed away now, fantastic uh, human, and I, I really love his work. And he says this, he says, forgiveness is a lot moral in nature, you know? Uh, and so when you say you cannot have forgiveness if violence is continuing, and what is happening in Gujarat is that violence continues and continues and continues. You have to juxtapose forgiveness with justice. Justice is even more important than forgiveness in democracy, he says. And justice is not just legal, but it's also moral because it serves the victim. This is going in line with some of the things Wim was saying earlier. You know, it's like, how do you forget that kind of history and what disservice are you doing? And in the same way, he says, it's illegal justice, but it's also moral. And if you don't, you know, and you're not serving the victim if you don't do it. So what is our mythology of forgiveness in Gujarat? So this is what I will end with. And it says, no, there's no acknowledgement. There's no remorse. There's no justice. And therefore, there's no forgiveness. And we in Gujarat would probably agree with C.S. Lewis, who says, everyone, for, uh, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And further, we would say forgiveness does not necessarily heal. Forgiveness can only happen when it is a right moment. Only when the time is right, people can forgive. And not everyone has the right to forgive. People who have suffered, who are the victims, they are the ones who get the right to say when it is the time to forgive and how to forgive. So that is what I would say is the mythology of forgiveness in Gujarat today. I'll end there and pass it on to Michelle. Thank you, Pushpa, and thank you, Wim. You are a hard acts to follow. I'm not doing a PowerPoint, largely because PowerPoints make me crazy to make. I love other people's PowerPoints, but um, they are hard for me. So um, the title of my talk is Forgive and Forget, or Forgive and Remember. Uh, meditations on the limits and the possibilities of forgiveness. And I want to start with a different kind of acknowledgement. Solomon Bailey, Clementa Pickney, Cynthia Marie Graham Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lee Lance, to Payne Middleton Doctor, Tawanza Sanders, Daniel Simmons, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Myra Thompson, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Chloe Anthony Wofford Morrison, George Floyd, and Brianna Taylor. Some of these names may be familiar to you. You may recognize them. Some of them you may not. I name them today in a partial acknowledgement of the ancestors and I call upon them and all of my ancestors for their help in giving this talk. I also want to shout out to two apparently very different and perhaps odd inspirations for this talk. Um, well, more than two actually. Um, one are the collectively the students in my courses, honors 142H, Why Forgive, AFR 346V, Imagining Slavery, and First Year Seminar 100, Afrofuturism, or How Long Till Black Future Month. Um, and then secondarily to um, LeBron James, late of the Cleveland Cavaliers, 
more recently of the Los Angeles Lakers and once again, uh, the MVP of the 2020 NBA championships. And um, I hope by the end of my talk, you'll understand why. As Wim um, and Pushpa both know, I have for a long time taught a course that's literally called Why Forgive? Question mark. Um, and it's a particularly amazing opportunity to be teaching it this semester in the midst of a pandemic, in the wake of an ongoing uprising for against brutal, police brutality and social justice. Um, and to be doing it while I am also teaching a course about popular cultural represent representations of antebellum slavery and Afrofuturism. So I say this as a kind of framing context and um, I will um, be happy to answer any questions about that when I get to the end of the talk. Like women Pushpa, this talk um, takes the form of um, a series of stories. Mostly it's a story about my course on forgiveness this semester. Um, we begin looking at religion, the book of Jonah, the Sermon on the Mount, Buddhism. We read some fiction. And this year in particular, we listen to a lecture called Forgiveness in the African-American Church Tradition, just before reading a philosophical text called Getting Even, Forgiveness and Its Limits, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon on loving your enemies. And lastly, a text that we're not, we have not yet read in class, but we will, which is um, a sermon on loving yourself, which is taken from Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. So if you recognize some of the names of the dead with which I began, the names of the ancestors, you might know some of them as the Emmanuel Nine. They were the members of the Bible study group uh, at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church who on June 17th, 2015, were murdered by a white supremacist. When he arrived at the church, they invited them, him to join them in their Bible study. And at the end of the session, he killed them. Solomon Bailey is an enslaved African-American who left us the narrative of the, his story of forgiving his master who had beaten him to the point that he had fainted had he not looked to Christ in my, in my faith, he says. These are all examples from the lecture on forgiveness in the African-American church. Um, and the context of the lecture, which uh, was really in some ways illuminating to me, was a discussion of the way in which two branches of Christian tradition in and around forgiveness emerge out of the experience of antebellum slavery. One that's part of a tradition that um, apologized for, tolerated the institution of slavery and one which challenged that institution um, based in the reading and the understanding of the gospel as preached to enslaved Africans and African-Americans. So Solomon Bailey frames his decision to forgive his master um, as the act of emulating he who has suffered most, the archetypal sufferer, Christ, my students connected to the Sermon on the Mount and Christ's injunction that we are to be perfect even as he is perfect. It's also a way, a means of holding on to meaning in the middle of an absurd situation, an absurd world. In this case, it's the absurdity of unchecked white supremacy. Some theologians argue that this is a way of attaining a kind of 
moral superiority, a kind of leverage against those who are more powerful than they. And I'll, I'll return to that point in a moment. I think of it largely as an assertion of one's humanity in the face of a system that denies the humanity of black people, of people of African descent. And I use the present tense deliberately. It was true then, it remains true now. So this is the lens through which I want to spend a little time talking with you about Martin Luther King's sermon, Loving Your Enemies. This is a, a sermon that he delivered at Christmas time, 1957, at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. He wrote it while he was in jail, where he also wrote the other, perhaps more famous, letter from Birmingham jail. Um, jail for committing nonviolent civil, civil disobedience uh, during the Montgomery bus boycott. So he organized the sermon around two poles, the practical and the theoretical. And I am mostly interested today in the practical. He begins by asking the question or saying, making the assertion, let us be practical and ask the question, how do we forgive our enemies? How do we forgive our enemies? And actually, I think he's, he's asking why we should forgive our enemies. Because he answers his question by saying that we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power of love. Forgiveness does not mean ignoring what has been done or putting a false label on an evil act. It means rather that the evil act no longer remains as a barrier to the relationship. Forgiveness is a catalyst creating the atmosphere necessary for a fresh start and a new beginning. It is the lifting of a burden of the canceling of, canceling of a debt. The words I will forgive you, but I'll never forget what you've done never explain the real nature of forgiveness. Certainly one can never forget but when we forgive, we forget in the sense that the evil deed is no longer a mental block impeding a new relationship. Likewise, we can never say, I will forgive you, but I won't have anything further to do with you. Forgiveness means reconciliation, a coming together again. And I would add for African-Americans, for black people in 21st century America, it's simply not practical to leave even if we wanted to. And for many of us, that was a moot choice, believing as we do that we built this country, it is our home and we will claim it. But I think he in the same voice raises a challenge to the truism that we should forgive and forget. And I was really glad, Wim, that you raised the question both of um, history as well as individual offense, because that's the question. So the counter question for me, the question that popped into my head the first time I read this sermon and continues to haunt me is, what about forgetting and remembering? What does it mean to forgive and to hold the offender, the violator, accountable for his or her or their Acts. King offers us a partial answer to this question. When he makes his next point, we must recognize that the evil deed of the enemy neighbor, the thing that hurts, never quite expresses all that he is. An element of goodness may be found in our worst enemy. An element of goodness may be found in our worst enemy. That's a pretty challenging statement on October the 17th, 2020, in the midst of uh, a highly volatile political season in which appeals to white supremacy are still being offered as a reason to vote for one candidate over another. But I think it does, it works for me in two ways. And in part, this comes from reading with my students, Jeffrey Murphy's very interesting book, Getting, Getting Even, Forgiveness and Its Limits. 
a student said to me, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Because getting even doesn't seem to say much about forgiveness. And my response was, well, if you think about getting even in terms of retribution, then you're right. It doesn't. But what if it's a different kind of leverage? Now, Murphy introduced them and me to this idea that if you forgive someone who demonstrates no remorse, that can become a kind of arrogance, kind of moral arrogance and moral condescension. And that's dangerous. As King remarks in his sermon, um, moving out of that moral arrogance can moat uh, motivated by moral arrogance, can motivate us to desire to defeat or humiliate the enemy when we should in, instead seek to win his friendship and understanding. How do you do that? I'm not sure. But both Murphy and King suggest that one way to do that is to respect the humanity of the offender to not think of the offender as wholly evil, to not judge the offender by the worst thing he, she, or they has ever done, but to respect a shared humanity. What does that mean? I think it's one way of understanding what it means to forgive and, rem and to remember. I think it's a way of forgiving and yet holding the offender accountable for what has been done. This is an accountability that is fueled by a kind of respect. If we can't manage love, um, but also a kind of love rather than resentment or vindictiveness. And I'll just share that one of my students' favorite chapters in his book is Two Cheers for Vindictiveness. Murphy makes a fairly compelling argument for resentment, if not allowed to control, if not the last word, but the first word, because resentment acknowledges your own humanity and your regard for yourself. So at this part in the sermon, King goes on to the theoretical question of loving our enemies. But I want to stick to the practical one for a moment longer. Because part of what I think is implicit in what Murphy tells us about the importance of resentment in a minor way as the first word is the importance of self-regard or self-respect. That those feelings remind you of your own humanity in the face of a system, the, the absurd system of of antebellum, antebellum slavery or anti-Black racism that denies you that humanity. So for my last story, my last text, I want to talk about another sermon that's um, given in defense of or as an instruction manual to learning how to love ourselves in order that we might respect our humanity, that of the offender, and hold that person accountable for his, her, or their acts. And this last um, little piece comes from Toni Morrison, who Wim knows is my favorite of persons. Um, and if you didn't recognize Chloe Anthony Wofford Morrison, that's Toni Morrison, who became an ancestor a little over a year ago but she left us her words. So this is, if you're familiar with the novel, this is the sermon at the clearing as preached by baby Suggs. Here in this place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it, love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. 
Yonder they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands, love them, raise them up and kiss them, touch others with them, pat them together, stroke them on your face because they don't love that neither. You got to love it, you. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder, out there, they will see it bro broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream <clears throat> from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leavens instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms. Strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unused and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you got to love them. The dark, dark liver, love it, love it, and the beat, and the beating heart, love that too. More than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air, more than your life-holding womb and your life-giving private parts, hear me now, love your heart for this is the prize. I read it at length because it's a sermon that I need to hear on an almost daily basis. It's evidence of the ways in which forgiveness can be used, not as leverage for moral superiority as it, much as it is for evening the ground on which we meet. That's the other way to think about getting even. Not retributive, or not retribution, but restoration and accountability. And I'll also say, just in passing, that that's the intersection between forget, why forgive and imagining slavery as we just finished watching the film Beloved and talking about this novel. So you may be wondering by now, but where does LeBron James come into this? So um, my shout out to LeBron James is listening to NPR the other morning, two stories. One was the anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize on October 14th. The other was a really intriguing conversation about the NBA Finals and LeBron James and a statement that he made at the end of his being interviewed. Um, he said a great deal, but he ended with, and I want my damned respect to. And the two commentators were puzzled. What could he be talking about? What could he be talking about? He's, he is possibly the greatest basketball player of all time. He is highly respected. Once again, he's been, he's been named most valuable player. And I thought to myself, you have entirely missed the point. When LeBron James stands on the basketball court and says, I want my damned respect too. And I went and replayed it. Um, I, he's thinking about, I imagine, I know I'm thinking about Laura Ingram declaring, shut up and dribble. The controversy over football players and basketball players, men and women taking a knee when the national anthem is played to signal the danger and the brokenness of our country. There are lots of ways to other people, to objectify people without killing them. And one way is to elevate them to mythological status and not allow them the right to be human. So that I have one last, there it is, one last thought. So I'll end with another, uh, what for me was really telling kind of statement and it came oddly enough, 
I think it was at the um, NAACP Spirit Award some years ago, where the actor Jesse Williams ended his acceptance speech with these words. The burden of the brutalized is not to comfort the bystanders. That's not our job. Just because we're magic doesn't mean that we are not real. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. So we have about 20 minutes and um, all three of us would be are here and happy to continue the conversation with all of you. If you have any thoughts, comments, questions, please share your stories as well. Feel free to unmute and speak. We are a small group, so it's okay. Um, well, I did have a a thought, something that occurred to me, listening to uh, you, Michelle, and you, Wim. Because Michelle, you, you mentioned sort of um, early on about your course and the book of Job being on the curriculum for this course on forgiveness. And it's interesting because made me think back to when, when you're talking about your father and apologizing for not believing the experience of other people. And if you think about it, what was at its heart the sin of Job's friends is that they weren't believing what Job was telling them about his own experience. So I thought that was a, an interesting connection there. I just say I love that story about your father, Wim, calling his friend to apologize. I, I mean, it, it it it's truly moved me. I mean, it it shaped me in ways that I'm still trying to figure out now. Um, I mean, I could see how I know so much more about both you and Pushpa, seeing how these pieces form the whole, and I think that's part of the reason I'd much rather tell a story then put up a chart that shows statistics, which is actually what I'd most like to do at this specific moment, <laughs> um, which is kind of the irony in it. But so Michelle, when you shared about the ancestors who were murdered in a church, mm -hmm. uh, there was two things that immediately came to mind. One was that I remember when I gave a talk on forgiveness at the Gandhi King conference in Memphis um, about four years ago, that part of the activity I had was I gave people some of the questions that I had in my research survey about strongly forgive, possibly forgive, neither forgive or unforgive, mm -hmm. probably unforgive or definitely unforgive, right? And there were people who said that it would be easier for them to forgive the murderer, Dylan Roof, than they could if somebody plagiarized their paper and potentially got them threatened with expulsion from school. And I just thought this is insane. I mean, I get that school's important. Mm -hmm. And I get that there's age groups where the reality of getting kicked out of school is real, but the thought that actually plagiarism would be more unforgivable than murder I thought was insane right and and so it motivated me how do I ask the questions that tease out this distinction between what people actually think and so forth and I think when we share our stories we find out that of course of course people don't think murder is more forgivable but they can't connect to it right it's the disconnect <laughs> with the reality Mm -hmm. But then the other part was that I had this serious experience that my black students and my white students really responded to things differently. And so I'm going to put up uh, some statistics here that just kind of show a little bit about what is shown and also not shown in the numbers that I just think expose some of the tension that I'm trying to get to here. Um, All I have to do is find it. All right. Um, so 
So one of the things that I, I, I'll scroll up a little bit. You could see on the top here that there's three different sets of questions or uh, categories that I'm looking at here, gender, race, and religiosity. So I gave participants a uh, centrality of religiosity um, scale survey. And so at the bottom, you can see like kind of the ranked score here. In the middle two columns, there's no statistical significance between white people and black people, but black people are marginally more forgiving. Um, but on the right column, you can see like statistical significance, like the, the most forgiving category was the highly religious and the least forgiving category was people with low religion, which I think connects directly with what you were saying about the story of Job. And like, of course, faith-based traditions that teach people to be forgiving should be expected to produce people who are more forgiving. And so I was so frustrated, so frustrated. Why can't I make sense of this analysis? And then it hit me. I looked at the Pew research for the country as, the, as a whole and black people are more religious. And part of the explanation for that is given in the civil rights movement. Some of it's given in the kind of the self-defense or protection that's given by having a faith to turn to when you don't have a justice system to protect you. But so on question, I'm sorry this is taking so long to make this thought, but on question 10, Specifically, it says, I believe that forgiveness means overcoming anger or hatred. 78% of Black respondents agreed. 18% of Black respondents disagreed. That's the highest level of disagreement of any group. That suggests that there's a lot of people who actually believe you can forgive and still be angry. <laughs> which is a very remarkable thing for us to kind of make sense of. <laughs> what does it mean to forgive and stay angry? Well, um, Wim, I'll, I'll say, I'll read James Baldwin. James Baldwin has famously said to be black in America is to be angry almost all of the time. But he also says with equal sincerity that he didn't hate white people. And he was raised not to hate white people. And there are countless stories. Uh, I remember just recently listening to the story of a man whose father had been murdered by a white man when he was very, very young. And his mother and his grandmother never told him about this until he was about to go to college. And the reason for withholding that that story was they didn't want him to grow up hating white. So there's this idea, you have to figure out, I mean, you have to figure out how not to be consumed by your anger, but you also have to figure out that you, your anger is legitimate. It's a sign of your own self-regard. It's a sign of your own self-respect. And you have to figure out a way to live with that and not be consumed by that, which is really challenging. And I would say in particular for me, what's really challenging about giving this talk at this particular moment is not even so much anger as it is the temptation of despair. I mean, I've been doing this all of my life. And I think, how is it that we are still having this conversation? How is it that the narrative of the uprising for social justice is qualified almost inevitably first as rioting and looting when we have a really robust study that says 93% of all the demonstrations were absolutely peaceful. And yet when a commentator talks about this, they lead with rioting and looting and then follow in the subordinate clause. Although most of the protests, most of the demonstrations were absolutely um, peaceful. So we've got these competing, competing mythologies of blackness. Black people are dangerous. Black people are a threat. 
And yet, they're incredibly forgiving. And they are always willing to be the means whereby white people can redeem themselves in some way or another. So how can it be? You know, I'm five feet tall and dangerous, but there's assumptions, of course, that if you do something horrible to me, I'll forgive you. Um, it, it's, you, you opened with paradox, which made me really happy because I feel like um, we're living in extraordinarily paradoxical times. Um, I keep waiting for Rod Serling's voiceover and the Twilight Zone music to come on. Because uh, my husband and I are seriously contemplating what we're going to do on the 3rd of November or the day after. I have colleagues who say to me, you know, probably you shouldn't come to work that day. Because it could be dangerous. And I'm thinking, is this America? Well, yeah, it is. So it's just, it's a weird moment. Um, it's a weird moment to be talking about forgiveness. Um, I am grateful and appreciative, not only to LeBron James, but to the two of you for motivating me to be here today. And maybe there are other questions. We shouldn't just be talking to each other. Yes. But this is a very interesting conversation, but please jump in, those of you who have joined us today. If there's something you'd like to say, or ask or. Okay, I'm gonna jump in. Thank you um, so much for the talk this afternoon. Um, I'm Jen, I'm Brown. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to thank you for, uh, all three of you for opening up this idea of paradoxes. And while you, all three of you were talking, it got me to really think about the ways I myself forgive. So I'd like to just share in a couple of minutes how I forgive because it is my experience. Um, it's just something that came up literally because of this talk. So I uh, just wanted to throw it out there. Uh, I, I've realized that the way I forgive um, is cyclical. I, I do not, I was, I was thinking to myself, wh when is, when have, when was my moment of enlightenment? When, when, when was my, when are, when, when did I become politically aware? Like when was saying, when, when were my moments of getting triggered? And what I realized in myself was I, I move through zones where uh, I, I, I'll forgive because I have to be morally arrogant. I'll forgive because I'm resentful. I'll, uh, you know, and I'll forgive to protect myself. I'll forgive because I really truly feel really bad for the other person. I'll forgive in a form of self, but it's never the same. And, and every day is like a cycle and some cycles last longer and some cycles. Last, and then I was thinking to myself, sometimes there's pressure to forgive and that puts me back into a darker place as well. Uh, and we have this pressure, this sort of, you know, you need to forgive because it's the right thing to do. And so I was thinking to myself, well, what if it's okay? What if it's okay to say I can't? And, and sometimes I can, and it doesn't mean that I'm permanently forgiven at all. And the other point I wanted to say is that when I felt the anger, when, when I feel anger, I, I'm starting to think of it as anger is actually a, a, a physiological response of remembering that I am not connected with yet. Does that make sense? So it's almost like my body physiologically becomes angry mm -hmm. um, and, and I recognize it as anger in myself, but actually it's just like this response. So I'm just throwing it out there. And thank you very much for, for these thoughts and for allowing me the space to, uh, to look internally. So thank you, everybody. Cheers. Thank you, Jim. I really like the observation. And I think it goes very well, I think, with what you were observing earlier, Michelle, that there are certain conditions. And when I when I look to a group and I teach about this stuff, as I started accepting, like, actually, I have some expertise on forgiveness, but I don't <laughs> have expertise on other people's stories. Mm -hmm. That, like, 
if we think about the relationship between anger and stress, and if we think about the relationship between stress and blood pressure, and if we think about the relationship between blood pressure and cardiac disease, and we look at life expectancy, it's not that being unforgiving causes African-Americans to die younger. It's just one of a hundred contributing factors, right? Um, but it is a contributing factor. If you get to live a life where you, where you are unforgiving, not because you're hard-hearted, but because you just don't have people offending against you, like that is its own kind of privilege. Mm -hmm. Like figuring out exactly what you were talking about. Like, I'm angry today. Do I wanna use this as the catalyst to say, I'm not gonna work for this boss who's a jerk anymore? Or is it a thing like my boss is a jerk and I hate working there, but I still have to make this money and there's not another <laughs> opportunity in town because that's the story my students tell me. If I don't figure out how to forgive the police officer who pulls me over on the way to work for being black after sunset, then I'll get in trouble at work and I'll lose my, like that is a literal story that I've heard more than once, right? But the white students in class, they only learn from the story. I've heard this, does that really happen to you? And the person says, every day. If you're black in the wrong community, after dark, you will get pulled over every day. It's the story. The story tells the moral, right? Not the statistics, but but we only make sense of social justice when we start figuring out like that we can provide the evidence for the trends. Mm -hmm. But the second observation I wanted to make, and I know I'm just talking so much, but I just get excited, is that part of what happens when we tell stories is that there's things we don't say. I took out my land acknowledgement slide because I didn't feel like I wanted to take more time for that. I'm, I chose to not acknowledge the land that I reside on, which is something that I've actually said that I would like to make a point of doing in these panels, but because reading the slide takes a minute and that would mean trimming something. So it's the privileging. What, what's the story that we want to tell? Why do we want to tell it? What are the parts of the story that we don't tell? I, I like to, say more about being racist, sexist, and homophobic, and that I wasn't changed by shame. I was changed through forgiveness. And I'm still working on those <laughs> because I feel like that does a whole lot better in motivating the students who look like me to look within <laughs> than, it, than when I point to other people and say, those guys in the robes are the ones you have to worry about. Because that teaches people that racism is only the extremists mm -hmm. and not the mundane white male privilege that I still engage in. Thank you. We have just about two minutes if people want to say something else. I guess I'll hop in for a second. Uh, I'm Jacob. I'm a junior at American University and I'm actually currently doing a project that's tracing the discourses amongst black youth activists in the BLM movement. And although forgiveness isn't one of the topics that I'm overtly focused on per se, it is one that I've seen that comes up regardless of whether I initiate it or not. And I think it's a really interesting concept. And this project focuses only on people who identify as black and who are leading these movements, and rallies, and et cetera. And I remember talking to one of them and he said, what's saddening to him and angering to him is when he sees someone who's white stop taking a role, not as an activist necessarily, but as a fighter. That's one of my beliefs is if you're white, you can't be a leader, you have to be a fighter. It's not your place to be the leader. But they see themselves and they get called out for their past racism. And they say that and they say, oh man, I gotta stop. This is redundant. I'm like creating a paradox. 
and he gave this really interesting quote to me. He said, if it takes someone calling you out on your past racism to stop fighting, you were never really for the movement in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes into, if you admit that, and you really show that you have changed, even if you're not fully changed, but you're trying to, people tend to want to forgive you if you're really making those strides. And I think that's just something that's important to look at and something I've noticed. Thank you, Jacob. Anybody else would like to add something? Say something? All right, so if that's okay, we'll call it a close on time and uh, we'll, we welcome you to our next sessions. I think our next one is on Thursday next week on the 29th, I think, um, at four o'clock if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, you'll see it on our website, mm -hmm. justicestudies.org. Um, and if you have the Zoom link for today, then you have it for the next sessions of October as well. So uh, we do registration every month. So look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Pushpa. Bye.